Okay, should we start the last lecture? And there should be more people coming, it seems to me. Yesterday. Well, you had the last lab yesterday or this morning, I guess. So that's so now it's just a couple of uh, the secret sequence project tomorrow or Friday. Tomorrow and Friday. Do we have tomorrow? So, yeah, tomorrow, yeah, yeah, something about tomorrow, someone on Friday, but it's, I guess it's, I don't, I don't think it will take the whole day, but it will take, well, well it might, it might take a few day, a few hours, but, uh, but uh, and then, uh, uh, it's the presentations on Monday, yeah. so we'll, uh, yeah. as I said, we start at nine, I think, and then we'll, I try to make a schedule and send out before, and then uh, we hopefully we finish by lunch. And you have a full day to study before the exam. Of course, you have the weekend also. <laughs> uh, and uh, are the presentations just expected to be PowerPoint? Things? Yes, PowerPoint, PDF, Open Office, whatever you want. More things should work. So, uh, it's, well, if you want to do it on the, the board, you're welcome. It's up to you. Actually, board talks are much better normally, but there there are. Harder to make. <laughs> you need to prepare more. So you can do a Steve Jobs uh, presentation here. If you want to. Uh, so that's um, okay. But let's um, start with what we talked about yesterday. This is the wrong slide. This is not. This is not yesterday. This is today's. We should look at. Oh, yeah. So yesterday we talked about structure prediction from when you do not have a model view, and particularly I guess we talked about a bit of about the Rosetta method. It, it was described somehow in this kind of models. That you uh, take a lot of small fragments and you combine them together by replacing one by one. Do, do, do you all know what a Monte Carlo simulation is, by the way? Monte Carlo simulation is mm, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> so the idea of a Monte Carlo simulation, of course, comes from Monte Carlo. What is Monte Carlo famous for? Exactly, casinos, exactly. That's where the names come from. I don't know, remember exactly what it was, was, what was the first application, but it was certainly some kind of physics simulation sometime. So the idea is basically what you do is... Yeah, I, I was probably from the Manhattan Project, right? The story is that there was this guy from the Manhattan Project and he was in the hospital or something, quite bored, and he was thinking about some, yeah, generate of random numbers, and okay. came up with this idea that this could be perfectly one of these roulettes in the Monte Carlo casinos. Hmm. And I don't know what this was for, but it was Yeah, I don't know. Probably Manhattan Project, so there's certainly simulations of the nuclear future. But, but, but the idea is basically, um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's somehow optimization problem. So there's a classical problem in many computers and many problems is finding to find the find, find, find optimal, the minimum energy or the uh, the lowest energy of, of some kind. So you have some kind of variable here, and you have some kind of energy here. And you want to find this position here. And of course, you, you want to do this in many dimensions. You want to do, do, do some search. For the traditional problems, you, you, you use 
you try to take derivative and you try to walk down, so you have a lot of minimization methods to do that. The problem is that then you get stuck here, you can't get out of this here, call it, place here. And there are, I mean, you secondary, secondary derivatives, and there are, I mean, there's a lot of work done on that. It's actually often much more efficient than the Monte Carlo simulation, but there are cases when you think this is not, these are not, I mean, particularly when you have a lot of barriers about the complex landscapes, it's not that efficient. So, what you do here is basically, in the Monte Carlo simulation, is that you do, you do some random change. So you move, and you check the difference, the delta g, the difference in energy between this position and this position here. So do we, do we go up and down? So this, this you can do, you can do a random search, and if you go down, you will keep on falling down all the way until, until you get stuck here. But the trick is like what you do is that you have, a, even if you go up, so even if the delta g is bigger than zero, uh, you have a certain probability to, uh, to accept this change anyhow. And you can relate this to, to temperature, so basically you have uh, e to the power of minus delta t, right by rt. So basically, so you can describe it as, as a physics uh, motion, so you can simulate the motion of atoms like that by, because they're not always like, falling down to the maximum minimum, they have a temperature where they're moving around. So th th this is kind of a useful uh, method in many optimization problems. So here, of course, what we do in, 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 the, in the Rosetta method, the unemployed data, we make a random change. If the energy gets better, we keep it. But if the energy just gets slightly worse, we have a certain chance to react it or keep it. You, you, you draw random numbers if it's bigger than this, this number here. If, if it's much, much worse, if this density is very big, you have the, the chances are extremely small that you will be, be accepted. And uh, if you do that, keep on doing that, and there are you can do different types. You can start with a high temperature and lower temperature, or something, you can change it. You can actually often find quite good optimal minimums. I mean, but it, it's not always that if you have a simple energy function that looks like that, it's a very slow way to get there. It's much better to follow the derivative, I guess, go down. But for complex landscapes, it's kind of useful. And actually, you can, you can, you can simulate, simulate the motion. Instead of doing MD simulation, you, you could actually use this kind of method of simulation motion of atoms or proteins, whatever you want. So that's the model. So that, that's uh, what Rosetta and m most methods use somehow, some kind of multi simulations. So here you, you avoid getting stuck in this minimum here. And what do do? This one is very deep, so maybe you get stuck there completely anyway, because if you're there, it's very unlikely you can ya jump out of it. Uh, so then we talked about contact methods. So what was a key invention that was started being used for a few years in contact, contact predictions? So what is the key idea of contact prediction? Go to this slide. So we have a multiple sequence alignment. Somehow we get it. Doesn't really matter. Well, it matters how, but we have it. And we look at each pair of columns in this alignment. And we look for correlations or mutual information. So basically look at if this one changes at the same time as this one changes over here. Mm. So if, a, if they change at the same time, you can actually uh, you, you can assume that these two somehow in contact. This is an assumption made already in the 90s, and it sort of works better than random, but it doesn't work very well. And the key reason is because you also have indirect coupling. So that if you have this mutation here that's compensated and changing, you will also have changes here that actually meet with you see interactions between this one and this one. And then it's an old network of everything else being contact with that. So you have the direct and indirect couplings or indirect. Actions. So there are nowadays methods that can disentangle this. You can, you can from, from the observed correlations or mutual informations, you can actually calculate the uh, uh, 
uh, at least a model that could have generated these this observations. And this is actually can be quite different. So you can really, and, and what it does is that it significantly improves the quality prediction. So, so from going from something that looks like that in quantum map, you can get something that looks like that. But you have much more predictive. That quite a lot of context, and you never had that before, basically, in any case, even if you had very big alignment. So really, this is nowadays quite useful, and actually, it can be applied to many, many proteins. Unfortunately, most of the proteins that are you can apply it to, uh, you can probably also do my homology modeling, so the practical purpose is not very big. On the other hand, there are, well, there's, there's been a number, hundreds of proteins that have been predicted like that. Or hundreds of protein families, so it's tens of thousands of proteins you can model them, but it's really protein families. Okay. I guess that was the key questions, things to do. I told you about our work of how to improve it further, but that's more of a detail. So I put up some new, new um, papers on the web page. I think there are, I think the most of them were before, but I updated them today and I put it, it was one or two I added. So you can have a look at that. It should be on the model page. So any other questions? Any other things we did yesterday? We should keep on talking about domains. So this, this, I'm not sure if this, maybe this lecture should have been earlier. But let me first let me stop this.